This is Tamura 2017, paper number one. Let's get straight into it. Um, here's question number one. There are probably loads of ways to do this. Uh, essentially, we're just gonna find the function here, so we integrate this. Um, now, I'm gonna split this out into two fractions, so it's two x to the minus three, and then three x x to the minus, over x to the minus three, which you can say is a minus two. Um, and then we can, of course, integrate this to find the function y. Um, equals um, raise the power by one divided by I'm, I'm going to blast this pretty quickly uh, we know it goes through um, y is five and x is one put those in all these ones are good because one's the power anything is just one um, and you actually end up don't know why I wrote that twice that's weird you actually end up with c is six um, which makes this a function with six on the end uh, which I believe is this one here um, so that's good um, yeah just year 12 maths that one I think um, this one again more year 12 maths um, and there are probably tons of ways you can do this. You could expand out these brackets. Um, I chose to incorporate these two fractions together first. So times this fraction by 2x over 2x. Put them together and then square the numerator and the denominator separately. So square 4x minus 1 by itself. So that's 4x minus 1 times 4x minus 1, which expands out into that. Um, and then square the denominator to get 2 squared is 4, x squared is x to the 4. And then again divide each term by 4x to the 4. So 16 over 4 is 4. x squared divided by x to the 4, you, you take away the powers to get this, uh, and likewise for all of this. Um, and now I think this is probably the best way for me to differentiate it now, is that I can just follow the power rule. Minus 2 times 4 is minus 8, drop the power by 1, and so on. Do it again, and you get this. And again, they're, they're being quite kind, asking you to put 1 into it, because when you put 1 into these, these all just become 1s, because 1's the power. Almost thing is 1, and you get the answer of 5. Um, so yeah, nice. Question number three, uh, we've already done a similar one to this in a previous to a mirror video, I think. Um, so the gradient of line L is uh, minus two X, is minus two, sorry. Um, it's a perpendicular gradient is therefore gonna be positive a half, uh, negative reciprocal. Um, so that's the equation of the perpendicular line so far. Um, we know that it goes to minus six, zero. So when Y is zero, X is minus six. This is just basic basic stuff here and you get c is three so if i was to draw this, this is the original line six minus two x uh, and this is the um perpendicular line so there's a 90 degree angle here um passing through three up here and it's asking for the area enclosed by the two lines as the x-axis so this triangle in here um, now if i set y to be zero um in fact i already know this minus six because it's telling me when y is zero x is minus six for the blue line so that's fine that's there now if i set y to be zero here because um, that finds me where I am on the x-axis. Uh, I get x is 3, because 6 minus 2 times 3 is 0. So the space of this triangle here is 9. And now I just need to find the height of the triangle, because I'm planning to do for the area a half base times height. So to find the height of this triangle, I'm going to find this intersection point. And I do that by setting the two lines equal to each other. Um, so set this line equal to that line. Solve for x. You eventually get this. Of course, now that's the x coordinate. That's how far across you have to go, which isn't very useful for me to, to me. I want to know the y coordinate of it. So I just pick a line. This one is probably easier. And put in that x coordinate to find the y coordinate, the corresponding one. Now that's 12 over 5. Then you change this to be 30 over 5, I guess. And then you work out that it's 18 over 5. So your height is 18 over 5. So the area of the triangle is a half times its base 9 times its height 18 over 5. Um, 18 is 9 times 2. So the 2 from this cancels with the 2 down there, and these behind a 9, then you get 81 over 5, which you pray is one of the answers, but it's not. Um, so then you might have to do a bit of bus stop division, I guess, to work out that it's 16 and a fifth. Cool, question number 4. Um, so when this is multiplied by that, well, I may as well stop reading and just do that really quickly. There we are. I'm going to call it f of x as well, apparently. Um, the resulting product is divided by this. The remainder is 24. Okay, so it's talking about remainder. So I know we're talking about remainder theorem here. This came up last time as well. Um, just ignore this for a second. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, remainder theorem says if a sum function evaluated at a point A is equal to some number K, then when you divide that function by X minus A, that number you inputted, it leaves a remainder of k, that same number you got the first time. This is actually just a more general case of the factor theorem. The factor theorem says if f of a is 0, then this leaves remainder 0 when dividing. In other words, it's a, a pure factor. But the remainder theorem says whatever you get left over, that's also the remainder over here. So if I were to divide this function here, which I've just got by multiplying out these two things, if I were to divide that function by x plus 1 to, to essentially give me some other function that I don't care about, I'm going to get a remainder of plus 24 at the end, is what this is saying. 
But using the remainder theorem backwards, what I can say, therefore, is that, well, we're just looking at the case where a is minus 1, right? Because if I put in a is minus 1, I get, um, I get this, because x minus minus 1 is x plus 1. And k is there, then 24. But what that means, going back along the remainder theorem, looking at this part of it, is that means that f of minus 1 is therefore 24. Um, working backwards along this remainder theorem. Basically, I would recommend that you go to a textbook and find some practice questions on remainder theorem and just spend half an hour doing them um, because you're guaranteed to get yourself a question, um, at least one question in a two-member paper because it comes up every year in at least one or both papers each year. Um, but anyway, f of minus 1 is 24. Um, put in minus 1 as your x into all of this. Um, Again, it's it's nice because minus 1 behaves pretty nicely when you raise it to a power, um, and, and you just solve for p, and you get p is uh, 2, um, which will be your answer. Now, question number 5. We want to satisfy both those. Let's do the easy one first. Uh, we want that to be true, which means x has to be bigger than 4. We also apparently want this to be true. Um, now, I can factorize this to be that, and now just remember what this looks like. It's a quadratic that goes through the points 2 and 6. So when is it less than 0? It's less than 0 between 2 and 6, right? Um, cool. So we want x to be bigger than 4. Well, we need x to be bigger than 4. We also need x to be bigger than 2 less than 6, which means we can only have between 4 and 6. Right, because we need this to be true and this to be true, so that's the only conclusion. Now, unfortunately, this isn't in the answers, um, which is a bit annoying, um, and this is a bit of a weird question in general, but what we need to look for is we need to look for a question which has the same answer as this. So it's clearly not these two things, because th these just aren't the same as this. Um, but it could be one of these. Now, notice how close this is to that, right? Like, all this is is you've just changed the 2 out for a 4, so if you track that back, change that for a 2, sorry, change that for a 4, change that for a 4, you end up with x minus 6 and x minus 4, and that would be a 10, and that would be a 24, because 6 and 4 make 10, and 6 times 4 make 24. Um, so you'd end up with this question here, right? Like, uh, And working forwards from here, I guess, if you factorize that, you end up with this, which is going to give you this solution, in the same way that this gave you this solution. Um, so this is going to be the right answer. I haven't really seen a question like this before. I floundered on it for a bit before I worked out that that was all it was doing. Um, but yeah, weird. Question number six. Um, I'm actually going to do this in two ways. So you'll have to indulge me. I apologize, but not really. Sorry, not sorry. Um, the first way I'll do it is, um, I mean, I mean, this is talking about a circle with radius 12. It's talking about tangent that goes to the point 20 here. Um, the first way I'll do it is I'll, I'll think about similar shapes. We're being asked for, essentially, uh, the, the height of this coordinate or the length of this distance here. And I'll think about it in both ways, I guess. Um, now, this is a right angle here because tangents meet radiuses and right angles. So I have a right angle triangle here, length 12, length 20, which means I can work out this length here um, by doing a bit of Pythagoras and saying it's 16. I'll do that in a second. First, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call this angle here x, which means this angle here by definition must be 90 minus x because that makes these three add up to 180. Next, I'm going to look at the big triangle that's over the entire shape. Um, now, this has length 20 down here, a right angle, of course, down here, and the height I want to know. But this angle down here, I think we know that angle is. It must be 90 minus x because it's the same angle as this one here, right? Like this triangle is made up of this shape, which has this angle, and this triangle is the big shape, but the angle is the same. So this is 90 minus x, which means this is also x, which means these are similar shapes because all the angles are the same. Now, the problem is that I don't have a corresponding side right uh, just yet but that's fine because i can work out the last side of this um 20 squared minus 12 squared is 16 squared it's just a scaled up version of the 3 4 5 triangle um but this is 16 and now i do have a scale factor because the length between the right angle and 90 minus x goes from 60 to 20. so the scale factor you can just do this number divided by this number is 20 over 16. Um, which means to find y, I take the corresponding side, which is this one, 12, because that's between the right angle and x, and I do 12 times 20 over 16 must be y. Um, I think I just said here, this is 4 times 4, this is 3 times 4, cancel the 4s to get this, and whatever. You could also have cancelled this down earlier, but in any case, you get y is 15. Um, now, there is another way to do that question, which is absolutely beautiful, um, so I'm going to do it. Um, yeah, this is a right angle, like I said. 
Now, if I just showed you this triangle, ignore the H in the right angle here, we know the rule here. This is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now, if you introduce this H here um, and make a right angle up to the hypotenuse, then you actually have a new, loop, a new rule, which is inverse Pythagorean theorem, which is this, 1 over A squared plus 1 over B squared equals 1 over H squared, this length going up to a right angle to the hypotenuse. Um, and so if we look at our question here, we actually have, well, we only have three things in this formula, and we know two of them. We know the H, because this is a right angle, tangents to radiuses and the right angles, and this is 20. Um, so we have the 1 over 20 squared plus 1 over whatever this is equals 1 over 12 squared. Um, and if I just work up here for a second, we can solve this. This is a little bit annoying to do without a calculator, but eventually you find that this is a factor you can use, or a multiple, I guess, you can use down here. You could just do this, 400 minus 144, and then times those two together. That's also fine. Um, this ends up being a little bit lower numbers, but it doesn't really matter. Um, you take those away for this, and then you can square root both sides to get 4 over 60, and that's 1 over y. So you flip, when you have fraction equals fraction, you can flip over to get y over 1, which is, of course, just y, is 60 over 4, which is also 15. I would, I love this. I would bear it in mind, um, if you can, because it might come in handy. Question number 7. Uh, so we have an arithmetic progression, p, q, p squared. So we add some number, let's just call it d, to get from there to there. And then we have a geometric progression, p to p squared to q. Um, now, before I move on to that, I guess I can just quickly say that p plus d is therefore q, and q plus d is therefore p squared. Now, the geometric progression, now you times by the same thing when you do a ge geometric progression. It's times by p here. Um, now, if you times by p to get from p to p squared, which you obviously do, then you have to times by p to get from there to there, which means that p cubed is, is q. Um, p squared times p is q, so p cubed is q. That's useful. Um, find the sum of the first 10 terms. Now, I actually had to Google this, um, but here's the um, formula for the sum of the right series. If you're doing L-level maths, I, I mean... This is just something you're told, and you just have to remember, I guess. You can figure it out in the middle of the exam, but it will take you a bit longer. So just, just know this. Um, now, we know n is 10 because it's telling us to do the sum of the first 10. So n is 10. Now, what is a and d? Well, a stands for the first term, which I know is p, because this is the arithmetic series. But I don't actually know what p is yet. And d stands for the difference between the terms, which I've also called d. So let's work out what p and d are. But that's OK, because this looks like a bit like a simultaneous equation. Um, now, it's a simultaneous equation in three unknowns, p, d, and q. But if I know q is p cubed, then I can turn these two into a simultaneous in two dimensions um, by turning the q's into p cubes by this formula here. And this is a simultaneous equation that I'm sure I can solve. I'm just going to take the first equation away from the second, or the other way around, not really sure. Just this minus this to get this. Rearrange for this, and I'm just going to solve this. Um, of course, oh, I don't know where that's come from. I think I should have put that in later, but anyway. Um, yeah, ignore this, because I'm, I'm about to find that. Um, but I can factorize out P here, and then I can factorize this out, and I get this. And so the solutions to this equation are either P equals 0, P equals minus a half, or P equals 1. Now, which of these is correct? We'll read the question, P has to be less than 0. So this is the only correct one. Uh, and that's why I've written down this here. I should have animated it in later. But the first term, which is p, remember, the first term is now minus a half, I know. And of course, I can go back into here and I can find d by putting minus a half into this. Um, again, just be really good with fractions. It's going to help you out a lot. And um, we get d is 3 eighths. And now I have everything I need to answer this question. Put them all in the formula. Do this slowly. That's going to be minus 1. That's going to be 9. Um, this is going to multiply by this to make this. Minus 1 is the same as minus 8 over 8. Again, being good with fractions pays off. Pray that this answer um, is somewhere in here, and it is good. Cool. Question number 8. Okay, so I've got two things multiplying here, and apparently they're bigger equal to 0. Now, if two things are multiplying to make something bigger or equal to 0, there are two options. Either they're both bigger or equal to 0, or they're both less than or equal to 0. Those are your two cases. Um, so let's do them one by one. So this is the easiest thing to start with. Cos being bigger than zero. Um, if I look at the cos graph, which is this one, we're, we're only looking between zero and pi. So this is cos between zero and pi. This is sine between zero and pi. Um, cos being bigger to zero means that you have to be between zero and pi over two. Good. Um, this then, let's just evaluate that quickly. Move this two sine over, divide by two, and you get this. Um, now, again, you need to know your exact values if you're going to be taking this paper. Um, but sine equals a half at 
well, if you're still working in degrees, you can think of it maybe as 30 degrees. So it's equal at 30 degrees, which of course means it's also equal at 180 minus 30 degrees. But of course in radians, it's pi over 6 and then pi minus pi over 6 to give you these two answers. So we're less, we're less than a half when we're less than pi over 6 and when we're bigger than 5 pi over 6. Now, we need both of these things to be true. Um, so we just need to compare these inequalities slightly. Now, this is completely pointless because this is much bigger than the, the pi over 2 here. Um, but I have to be uh, less than 5 pi over 6. So less than pi over 2 is also irrelevant. I have to be back here somewhere, right? Like I have to be less than, sorry, I have to be back here somewhere. I have to be less than this, but also up here. So it's just going to be between 0 and pi over 6 when you when you just compare these equalities here. Um, so I know it's either A or B. Now I just deal with this one as well. Um, same kind of idea here. When we're less than 0 for cos, that means we're between here and here. So between those two values, same kind of thing for sine. Um, just do it again. Um, and you have to be, when, when sine of x is bigger than a half, you have to be between this pi over 6 and this 5 pi over 6. Compare these two expressions you have here. Um, well, this is the bigger lower bound, so we'll take that. And this is the lower bigger bound, so we'll take that. Um, and this is our answer up here. Cool. Question number nine. Yeah, always just draw stuff, right? Like, you can sketch this down. It won't look quite as good as mine on the computer, but you can still sketch this, so always do it. Okay, I'm just going to swap the two middle terms here. We've done this kind of thing before. This is just standard A-level maths here. Swap those two middle terms, then complete the square. And make sure you do that correctly. So this is a circle, center 9, 11, radius root 24. Um, so the picture might look roughly like this. Um, now, we're going to put a hexagon inside this circle. So I had to Google this, but this hexagon has six uh, sides. Um, and I want to know the area of this hexagon. So actually, this is um, it's interesting. I've, I've made a video about this elsewhere on the channel um, about how to find areas of these kind of shapes more generally. Um, and also, this is actually one of the... I think this is Archimedes' principle for working out pi or estimating a value of pi or bounding pi. I think it was him. But anyway, working out the area of this hexagon, you can go Google or YouTube that. I'm sure it's very interesting. Um, this length here out to the edge is, is also root 24. Um, this, this hexagon, by the way, should fit perfectly in the circle. I know it doesn't because I'm being lazy, but it should do. This is just a sketch. Um, and now I've got a triangle here. It's 360 degrees all the way around, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six of these triangles if you bother to draw the middle in, which means this is 360 over 6, which is 60. And now my plan here is the area of this hexagon is going to be the area of one of these triangles multiplied by 6 because there's 6 of them, right? Um, now what's the area of the triangle? Well, it's a half A, B, sine C. A half A times B times sine C. Um, now this is easy. Um, that's just 24. You need to know that sine 60 is uh, root 3 over 2. Um, and then you can, of course, say 24 divided by 2 is 12, divided by 2 is 6, and it's 6 root 3. Um, but remember, you've got 6 of those triangles. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of them. So it's going to be 36 root 3. Um, cool. Question number 10. Okay, um, so talking about gradients, so my first instinct is to differentiate. Be really careful. Do not say that the differential of this is 3p squared. In fact, don't say it's anything because p squared, p cubed is a constant. It's just a number, which means when we differentiate, it goes away. This differentiates to, that should definitely be a minus. I have typed that wrong. Just in your head, think of there being a minus there. I think it must turn up later. Um, it does immediately afterwards. It turns up nice. There should be a minus here. Okay, I'm going to evaluate it at x equals minus 1, um, this expression here. Um, well, that changes the sign of this. It doesn't change the sign of this because minus 1 squared is, is positive. Um, and now, this is the gradient at, of the curve at C. Now, the gradient of the normal is m, which means minus 1 over m is the gradient of the curve because, of course, we have that negative reciprocal thing going on. I'm going to rearrange this to be the other way around. Um, in fact, I'm going to just get rid of the negatives first, and then I'm going to rearrange it to be the other way around. And now the question is asking me to make m as big as possible. Um, to make m as big as possible, I want to make this as small as possible um, because when I divide by something small, I make something bigger. So I want to minimize this. Um, if I just call that some function of p, then I can differentiate. Um, 
and I can solve and I find that p is minus 0 0.5. This is a quadratic, right? So at its turning point, it's just a U-shape. At its turning point, that's when it's smallest. It's a positive quadratic as well. So wherever it turns, which is what I've just found by setting the derivative to be zero, wherever it turns, that's its smallest point. So it's smallest at p is minus 0 0.5, which I can just put back into here to find my biggest version of m. Um, so I'm just putting minus a half into here. Um, uh, you know, this is going to be, well, six times minus half is minus three. So these actually nicely cancel. This is going to be half time, well, minus times minus is positive. So that's going to be a quarter. Six, so that's going to be six divided by four there. And when you have a fraction, a number of a fraction, you bounce that number up to there to get four thirds, four sixths, which cancels to two thirds. Okay, apologies for that minus, didn't see it. it should be there. Okay. Um, so this is one of those ones where you just have to do the recursive thing a couple of times and pray that something nice happens. Um, so they've given me that x2 is 3 and x3 is 1. So let's find x4. Well, it's it's what happens when you put x3s into here. But I know x3 is 1, so it's just going to be 23 minus 53 over 5 times 1, which is just 5 plus 1, which is minus 5. So that's not very good. So let's look for x5. I'm going to have to put the x4 in, which is annoying because now I have to do 23 times minus 5, which is irritating. Then I have to do this. I'd recommend maybe a column subtraction for that. It's quite difficult though. Um, but but yeah, at some point you might be able to manage it. And then here, maybe a bus stop or whatever. But eventually you figure out it's 7, which is great. Um, because that means that x4 is, is minus 5 and x5 is 7. And you've arrived where you started, which means the next one is going to be 3 then 1, then minus 5, then 7. You can do this a couple more times if you want to to make sure, but it does just go 7, 3, 1, minus 5, 7, 3, 1, minus 5. It repeats. Um, and now let's look at how, uh, when, when do we arrive at 7? Well, we arrive at 7 on x1, um, x5. The next time, if we count, would be x9 um, because it's um, 7, not... Uh, 7, then x6 is this, x7 is that, x8 is that, x9 is this, right? Um, so the next one is eight, x9. And look at the sequence of the numbers down here, 1, 4, 5, uh, 1, sorry, 1, 5, 9. Um, we just need to say, is, is 100, is, is 100 going to turn up in this sequence of numbers down here? Is x100 in this, in this sequence? So it essentially is 100 in this sequence, 1, 5, 9. Now that's just 4n minus 3. Uh, is 100 in there? Um, it's, it's actually not. It's remained a 3 which means we arrive at a 7 and then have to go 3 further um, before we actually get to x100, which means x100 is minus 5. Quite quite, quite a difficult idea, that one. Um, again, practice is best there. There's lots of math challenge questions like that as well. Um, question number 12, um, polynomial is, is some positive function for all values of x. So it looks a bit like this. Like it's always above the x-axis. It's always nice and positive. Um, given the integral, now the integral between 2 and 4 looks for area, right? So in between 2 and 4, um, the integral of this is a is, is, is this area here, right? Now, which of these statements must be correct? Now, they've moved my function two places to the left in every single one of these, right? When you add a 2 in the brackets, you move it two to the left. So unless they've also moved their limits of integration two to the left, i.e. between, uh, between 0 and 2, I know nothing about the function. So they've moved my entire function two to the left. So unless these limits have also gone two to the left, I know nothing about what's going on, right? Because I only know anything about this area here, which so it must move with the graph around. So unless the new limits are zero and two, I know nothing. So it can't be any of this, right? It has to be one of these two. Now, what happens when I add one to the function? It moves up by one, right? Now, does that add one to the total area? Well, no, because when you move this function up by 1, essentially you create a little box at the bottom here of height 1 and width 2, which means the area of it that you've just introduced is 1 times 2, which is 2. So you've introduced an area 2 if you're integrating between a limit, which is width 2. So it's actually going to be B. Um, question number 13. Uh, let's just expand this out really quickly. Um, we're looking at the x squared term, which is this one, and the x to the 4 term, which is that one. Um, you do have to know how to evaluate 5 choose 3 and 5 choose 4 without a calculator. Um, I've just tidied that up slightly. But yeah, 5 choose 2. Now n choose k is n factorial over n minus k factorial k factorial. This is easy to do in your head with a bit of practice. Because if we just take the example 5 choose 2, it's 5 factorial over 5 minus 2, which is 3. 
2 factorial. Now, 5 factorial is just 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So you can always cancel the lower end of its tail with the highest tail on the bottom, which is this. So all of this 3 times 2 times 1 goes away with this 3 times 2 times 1, which leaves you with 5 times 4 and 2 times 1. 5 times 4 is 20, 2 times 1 is 10, and you end up with 10. You can do the same thing on 5 choose 4. Um, it's actually easier because this becomes a 4, um, and this becomes a 1, or, or this becomes a 1, and this becomes a 4. It doesn't really matter. But you then cancel more things, right? Because you'll have a 4 times 2 times... Two, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 on the bottom, which cancels with almost all of that. And, and you're just left with this being 5. Um, now, it says that this here... Um, sorry, this here is 8 times that here. So if you times that by 8, you get this. Um, if we... That becomes 80 divided by 5 to get 16. Of course, A and B are non-zero, so I'm okay just cancelling stuff out here. Um, so I'm okay with dividing both sides by A and dividing both sides by B squared. Now, what's the smallest way I can make this work? Well, it seems to me that choosing A to be 1 and B to be 4 is fine. 4 equals 4. <laughs> nice. Um, so B is 4, I think works, just logically. With A as 1, add them together for 5. I've ticked the wrong box. This is awful. I need to fix that immediately. Um, the answer, I think, is 5. Um, when you add 4, I can fix this as well, can I? When you add 4 and 1. Cool. Glad that I, you know, proofread all of this. Okay, um, next one. Cool. It says that the solution to this is x equals p, y is q. So let's just put those in, I guess. I'm going to rewrite this one in a slightly more intelligent way, which is I'm going to say... Well, this here is, you multiply these two things together, right? P and 2, which means I'm allowed to do this. Because when you when you break it out into a bracket, you multiply those together. Um, now, I've colored this in red, and long-time fans of the channel will know exactly why I've done that. Um, but, you know, if I've got any new new fans, you'll you'll find out soon enough. Soon enough. Um, but yeah, I've just, I've just separated those 2s and those Ps and Qs and stuff. Now, looking at this one, I'm just going to rearrange it for, for 2 to the P. I'm going to notice that it becomes 3 minus 3 lots of this, which I can factorize into 3, just lots of, of 1 left over and just 1 of those left over. Now, this is red because I'm going to put it into here. Um, so I'm just going to substitute that in. When you're squaring a product, you square each thing separately. So you square the 3 to make 9, and you also square this. Um, remember, this is this times itself, so it's two complete brackets, which you then expand out. Um, so 1 minus this minus another lot of that plus this squared. Notice how 9 lots of this cancels with minus lots of that, which is lovely. You're left with 8 minus 18 lots of this here, and we can solve this. Um, move this over to the other side, move this over to the other side, divide by 18. Um, again, I've coloured in. Um, you know why. I'm just going to quickly sort this out, though. Um, I'm going to write 1 over 6 as 6 to the power minus 1. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that is because now I can take log to base 2 of both sides and then move this minus 1 out to the front to get q. Um, now I'm going to put this blue thing into here to find p. Um, 1 minus a sixth is 5 sixths times by 3 um, is 5 uh, halves. Is it? Yeah, it is good. Um, and then I can do log to base 2 of both sides. And... Uh, and yeah, th th that's my expression for P and Q. It's asking me for P minus Q, so I need to do this minus this. Um, but minus minus, of course, makes a plus. And then when you've got two logs adding, you can multiply the inputs. Um, and this makes uh, 15, I think. So it's log 2 of 15, which is F. Question number 15. Um, that green line should have also been animated. Amazing proofreading was done today. Um, You've got to curve this. Now, I can sketch that really quickly. Um, that's this curve here. It has a y-intercept of 10. It's a negative quadratic. It's symmetrical around the x-axis. So that's the um, curve f of x. Um, now, this curve has just been moved one to the left. So that's easy. This curve is a bit more difficult. That green line is y equals 6. And I'm going to reflect this blue line in the green line. So what it's going to look like is going to look a bit like that. Um, there are thereabouts. It should match up exactly there, but whatever. Um, so that's the reflected line. And this question is saying, I'm going to use the trapezium rule to estimate the area between 0 and 1. 
Now, if we remember about the trapezium rule, it's when you put in a bunch of trapeziums underneath a curve and estimate the area of it. Now, if a curve sort of convex, you underestimate because the curve always goes slightly above the straight line you're putting in. And for curves that are concave, uh, it's an overestimate because it goes over where the curve kind of bends down and underneath. So when we have these three curves and we're evaluating them between zero and one, all we have to do is think about which are convex and which are concave in this interval. Um, and now the blue and the green are both convex. Um, so I'm gonna underestimate both of those areas. Um, but the, the, the black graph is concave. So I'm gonna overestimate that. So it's gonna be an under, under, over um, for one, two, and three. 16. Um, cool, so an increasing function of the derivative is bigger than zero, decreasing less than zero. So let's find the derivatives. That one's an easy derivative to find. Um, it's also easy to find when it's bigger or less than zero. Um, it's bigger than zero when x is greater than minus two. It's less than zero when x is less than minus two. Easy. The other one is slightly more difficult. Uh, differentiate it nice and nice and quickly. Um, say it's bigger than zero here. Divide everything by three is much easier. Now, this is a quadratic with roots at minus three and minus one. So it looks a bit like this. And so it's bigger than zero when x is less than minus three and more than minus one. And that's when g is increasing because, of course, this is the derivative of the function. And then it's less than zero when it's g is decreasing between minus three and minus one. Um, and now we need one to be increasing, it doesn't specify which, and the other to be decreasing. So let's choose f to be increasing first, and therefore we have to choose g to be decreasing. Is there a time in which these two match up? Like, do they happen at the same time? Well, yeah. Um, if x is bigger than minus 2, but less than minus 1, that's fine. Right? Bigger than minus 2, less than minus 1, those both, count, both match. Um, which is uh, this one here. And I think that's the only one... That has that. Oh no, this also does. So it's between this and this. Um, I was not very careful with my signs, but that's okay. We can figure it out. What about the other way around? When f is decreasing, so you need to be less than minus two, and you need g to be increasing. So is there a time when this matches? Oh yeah. When you're less than minus three, you're also less than minus two. Um, so you also can be less than or equal to minus three. So it's this one e. Okay. I can feel my voice going. Um, so I'm going to try and get through this quite quickly. Um, let's just integrate f of n. Um, and, well, let's not do that. Let's do this integral um, on n. Um, so integrate this as nx minus x squared over 2. Evaluated between n and 0. Don't need the plus c because it's definite. Um, put n into here to get n squared minus n squared over 2. Uh, when you put 0 in, you just get 0 minus 0, so it doesn't matter. This is, of course, um, n squared over 2, which cancels to get n over 2. Easy. So the sum of f of r from 1 to n is the sum of this from 1 to n. So I'm just doing the sum of that from 1 to n. Now, this divided by 2 I can just take out, and then you might recognize this, but the sum of just the whole numbers from 1 to n is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Um, I think I have a video on this channel explaining that, um, but I'm sure you can also find videos if you're unsure. You can also use that formula we saw earlier, which I can't be bothered to paste again. Um, but I think people who are taking Tamira probably generally know this. Anyway, you can obviously multiply those two together and you get that g of n is this. Now, we need g of n to be bigger than 150. So we need this to be bigger than 150 times over the size by 4. And now I'm going to be super lazy here. I could solve this quadratic if I wanted to, but I definitely can't be bothered. Um, n is a positive integer, so I just need an integer times by the next one to be bigger than 600, and it needs to be the smallest case. So let's just try 22. 22 times 23 is that, apparently. That seems a bit small, so I'm going to skip one and go to this. 24 times 25 is 600, which isn't bigger than 600, but it is as big as you can be without being bigger than 600, so the correct answer must be this. 25 times 26 must be bigger than 600, and it must also be the smallest thing that is. Um, so the answer is D. Interesting question. Question number 18. Ooh, I've already got my axis down, apparently. Uh, y equals log base 10 of x is this graph here. <laughs> Absolutely horrendously drawn. Um, it's translated in the positive y direction, so it's moved up by two units. Um, so this is the line. I put the two first just to make sure there's no confusion about this not being log base 10 of x plus 2. It's, the plus 2 is its own thing, so I'll just put it in the front. It's not going to make a difference. Okay, apparently... Doing that is the same as doing a stretch factor on the original graph 
parallel to the x-axis. So I've stretched this graph. I've actually squashed it, haven't I? I've squashed this graph inwards into here. Now, all I need to do here is work out what these two points are. So where's this point? Well, when y is 0, what do you have to raise 10 to um, to get... Sorry. If y is 0, you just do 10 to the power of 0, which equals 1. Um, and so x is 1. Um, a log to base anything of 1 is 0, is the other way of, of working that out. I think I do it properly here. Um, to look for this point, I set y as 0, because I'm on the x-axis. Uh, take away 2 from both sides, then raise both sides to the power 10. Now this is 1 over 10 squared, which is 1 over 100, which is 0 0.01. Okay, so this point here is 0 0.01, or 1 over 100. So it's tempting to scale, the scale factor is 100, because you're squashing it in by a factor of 100, even though this graph doesn't look like it at all. That's okay. Um, but remember how stretching and squashing works. If you have a function f of x, f of 2x actually stretches the function out, like it doubles the width of the function outwards. Whereas f of a half x, when you take a smaller number, that squashes it in. So squashing this graph in is going to be a very small factor, which is going to be the factor 1 over 100, or 0 0.01. So I ticked this originally, not thinking about it, but it is actually this. Um, question number 19, we are almost there. Um, okay, this is the, uh, oh, what this is saying, uh, we've seen this a couple of times. If you're solving this quadratic to be less than zero, and it, these are the answers, then that means that P and Q are the solutions of your quadratic. And you're just saying, well, the quadratic is less than zero between its two roots, right? Now, this doesn't end up being that important, but it's nice to know what we're looking at. Um, let's actually solve for what P and Q are, and I can do that by using the quadratic formula. Now notice how this is really nice because all it is is the quadratic formula without the A. So I just take this and say A is just 1. I'm um, also, though, when I do that, I'm just going to move this 2 to be a half here. And I'm going to do that just because it makes it a bit more clear, I think, later on. Um, so P and Q, which I know are the roots, are this, because this is just the formula without A, or with A as 1, I guess. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to work out the roots of this. So A is 1, B is BC, and C is C cubed. And I'm going to put those into my formula and say the roots are minus BC, because that's the B term. Um, square it, uh, and then this is C, and A is just 1. I'm going to put this 2 over as a half over here, just like I did before. And I'm also going to factorize out a C squared from this thing. And the reason for that is that when you take a root of a product, you can just root each thing. So I can root the c squared, which just makes c, and then I can leave this thing as a root here. But notice how I can factorize out a c from that as well. And what's important about this is that the roots of this new equation, or inequality, I should say, are just precisely the roots of the old one multiplied by c. Like, all that's different here is that you've got a multiply by c. So if the roots of the old one are pq, the roots of the new one are PCQC. And there's a massive sting in the tail of this question because, of course, it's not asking for the roots, it's asking for the interval that you're less than zero. So all you need to do is find the roots and then put them just like this. And it's so easy to go, oh, well, P is the smaller one and Q is the bigger one. Um, so therefore, when I times by C, PC is the smaller one and QC is the bigger one. Therefore, it's this answer here. And that's what I did the first time. Um, except it's not, because c is less than 0. So when you times these both by c, both roots by a number that's less than 0, they swap order. qc is now the smaller one, pc is now the bigger one, um, and the answer is d. Yeah, be careful of that. Very last question here. You have a triangle, sides a, a plus d, a plus 2d. Um, exactly like so, you're looking for this angle. Seems obvious to do some cosine rule here. Um, so there's the cosine rule. These are your three sides. There's your angle. Let's put it in. Um, I'm, I think I kept that as C. I probably should have changed it to an X. I think I've kept it as C the whole time thinking about it. Doesn't make a difference, I guess. This X is just this big C here. Um, expand this out. Do it properly. Like, double those brackets out and use proper expanding. Do the same thing here. Um, when you tidy this up, you get this expression. Um, and then if I move on to the next page, I can divide both sides by the thing over here. Now, this looks horrific, um, except I can actually factorize this. I can take a 2a out, and I can also factorize this, which is a difficult spot, um, admittedly, but it is question 20. Um, and then I can cancel the a plus d, a plus d, and I get this. 
Now, what do we do next? Well, the one thing that we, in the question that we haven't used is this. 3D is bigger than 2A. Which means that if I wanted to replace this with a 2A, I'd be taking away something smaller. Now, if you take away something smaller, you get something bigger. So if I just replace this with a 2A, this whole thing becomes bigger because I'm taking away something smaller. Um, and therefore, this becomes smaller because this whole thing is, is now bigger. This is the smaller one. But of course, this evaluates easily. This is just minus A over 2A, which is minus a half. Um, and then the A's obviously cancel, so it's just minus a half. So I need cos of my angle to be less than a half, minus a half. Now, if I draw the graph of cos one more time today, this is the graph of cos. Now, think for a moment why I'm only drawing this up to 180 degrees. It's because, remember, I'm talking about a triangle here. Um, and I can't put an angle bigger than 180 in a triangle anyway, so I'm just going to draw it up to 180 degrees. I need cos to be less than minus a half. Now, again, you don't have a computer to draw graphs for you in the exam, but you should know that cos of 60 or cos pi over 3 is a half which means the other way to get a half is to go 6 degrees or pi over 3 beyond 90 because of this symmetrical idea here. And so cos of 120 or 2 pi over 3 is minus half. And you need to be smaller than minus half. So you need to be bigger than um, 120. And of course, less than 180 because it's a triangle. Um, and you get your answer. I'm really running if you stuck through that. Um,